Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to our webinar. Uh, you're joining the Q1 Manufacturing Outlook webinar today. My name is Richard Austin. I'm BDO's Head of Manufacturing. Um, it's going to be an interesting one, this one. Um, at the end of last year, uh, if you remember the Q4 webinar that we had and the report that came out, it was looking pretty concerning in terms of the outturn for, for year end. Um, and that was probably driven by a number of factors, including clearly inflation, supply chain disruption, energy levels, etc. cetera. Um, but interestingly, um, it appears that manufacturers have started to buck that trend in our latest survey. So that came out yesterday, uh, but it's definitely showing a rebound in, in activity. Um, so um, today's gonna be an interesting one. Uh, we're delighted to be joined today by Make UK Senior Economist, James Broom who will be providing a high-level manufacturing and economic update based on the results of the Outlook report, uh, which was published yesterday. Uh, and then following that, we'll be joined by uh, a number of my colleagues from BDO um, and running a session on turnaround in manufacturing. So the team that will be joining me this afternoon on that will be Chris Marsden, who's a business restructuring partner at BDO. Uh, we also have Ross McQuarr, who's an assistant director in value creation services at BDO. Uh, and finally, but by no means uh, least, uh, we have Steve Cooney, who's a principal in the value creation services team at BDO as well. And they'll be sharing insights into areas of uh, business stress in the manufacturing sector, as well as showing some really practical actions and improvements that businesses can make uh, to avoid uh, getting into uh, financial difficulties. Um, at the end of that, we'll be uh, having a live Q&A session so please do, as always, submit any questions that you have through the Q&A functionality, which you should see at the bottom of your screen, which we'll pick up at the end of the session. So without further ado, I will hand over to James uh, at uh, Make UK. Over to you, James. Thank you very much, Richard, and, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, and Richard is right. It's, it's a rather unexpected um, outcome for this first quarter of the year survey and a, and a positive one. Um, and actually makes a very refreshing break, especially those of you that might have tuned in uh, in previous quarters, maybe every single quarter of the past year has been tinged with an air of uh, pessimism and, and, and perhaps worse than that, uh, sort of sure pessimism that the trajectory of the year is going to be a low and slow uh, decline in, in our uh, manufacturing outlook metrics. Uh, what has happened in the intervening period between uh, the end of last year and, and now is a clearly an unlocking of some of those limitations that has allowed manufacturers to, to uh, supersede and outpace their own expectations that they set only at the end of last year. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll give you a, a brief overview of the, the findings, then we'll delve into a few of a few graphs I have looking at some of the metrics in detail and how they've evolved over the past uh, quarter and how they compare indeed over, over the past five years. Um, and then we'll have a little uh, horizon scanning moment about what the future looks like for the next coming quarters. And, and again, a, a slightly more positive look than what we, what we had anticipated in the past year. So if I could have the next slide, please. So um, output and order is probably the most important uh, headline metric of our work. Uh, they are, the, they are the, the metric that outperform themselves the most significantly compared to their expectation last quarter. Uh, we still see a phenomenon uh, that has carried on for quite a while now that UK orders continue to uh, outpace export orders. Uh, a lot of questions here as to how much of this is the systemic uh, uh, systemic effects going on from the uh, UK's exit from the EU, how much of this is reshoring, how much of this is nearshoring or friendshoring, and that, that, that whole group of terminology that includes the word shoring. Uh, one thing that is still um, cause for concern and something that hasn't uh, gone perhaps the way of other metrics is price growth. Um, but there is a silver lining here. So price, grow, price growth has continued to um, grow and sort of remain quarter to quarter at those elevated levels, near record-breaking levels. The good news is, is that margins are set to start recovering. And you might remember from previous quarters, and it's certainly detailed in the report, uh, perhaps our largest concern for the sustainability of the industry in the short term was the widening gap between rising prices but declining margins. Uh, demand for labor has returned 
um, having it's it hasn't really gone away, but it, it peaked in around May of last year. Uh, it started cooling off quite rapidly towards the end of the year as as manufacturers saw that the incoming year this year um, was going to uh, have a reduced amount of work. And so those vacancies started closing up. We're seeing that decline in vacancies pause as industry turns around and and notices that demand is coming back faster than expected. So uh, in, employment intentions are increasing again. Uh, investment intentions have bounced back after spending one quarter in negativity last quarter. And then follows, of course, that we see a, a moderate boost in confidence uh, across both our business confidence metric and our wider UK economy metric. Uh, however, our manufacturing output growth forecast for 2023 doesn't avoid uh, negativity at minus 3.3%. Uh, that is revised uh, from, a, from a more negative position uh, quite recently uh, with some, some moderate uh, or negligible growth in 2024. Slightly different story for our overall UK forecast. Uh, that's at minus 0.4% for 2023 and 1.5% growth in the coming following year in 24. So what I'll do now is I'll, I'll start talking about uh, some of these metrics, starting off with output and orders. And it gives you a little bit of context as to what I've just been talking about. So you can see here quite clearly, um, you, 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 would, uh, you would forgive me for, for holding that pessimism. If you look at the path, the far, I suppose, six or seven groupings of orange and red bars, which are balance of change figures for output in the red and orders in the orange. And you can see here in the uh, in the ultimate bar at the very end, uh, we see that um, it's bounced uh, higher uh, than those previous quarters. And if we'll see in a, in a coming slide as well, that that projected trajectory uh, only as of last quarter was expected to turn below the zero line this quarter. So quite a surprise in this period. And I'll talk more about what's happened in this intervening period that's um, that's uh, that's caused this this unexpected upturn in, in, in a couple of slides time. Could I have the next slide, please? So this is a breakdown between the UK orders and export orders that make up that orders metric. Uh, wherever you see a green box, uh, that is manufacturer's future intention. So that is not our forecast that is uh, surveyed from the industry uh, asking what they expect in their short term view in the next three months, how that given metric is going to look. So in this case, UK orders and export orders. And we can see here that um, that relative positivity is set to continue into next quarter as well. Uh, next slide, please. And this is what's the interesting uh, part about that expectation being subverted. So there's a lot going on here, but I can I can break it down quite simply. If we pay our attention to the, the right hand side of the chart, um, what this shows is the difference between what industry expected in the previous quarter and what actually came to pass when that quarter comes to pass. So their expectation for orders and outputs are the bars, the orange and red bars. And then the what actually comes to pass in that quarter are the dots. So we can see if we hop back about, if we just visually look about three, three or four bars along from the right, uh, we can see that actually expectation was seriously outpacing what was coming to pass. We can see those dots are quite below what, what that expectation was. And then in the green highlighted box here, the, the, the small slither of bars that you see underneath, that's what was expected to happen this quarter. So that's why uh, in the last quarter of last year, so Q4 of last year, um, expectations and outlook was pretty pessimistic. And indeed, that was shared by industry as well, as illustrated by that very small slither of bar in the negativity there. What's come to pass is surprisingly positive, uh, which is good news. And again, for, for the second quarter, we can see that that uh, positivity seems to be coming forwards. The main driver, two, two things really at play, but the main driver for this unexpected boom uh, in output and orders and return to activity after such a bleak outlook in the end of last year has been the uh, easing of uh, supply chain limitations, supply chain disruptions. Uh, they have uh, eased at their fastest rate for quite a few years. So that is that is the limitation in, in layman's terms of the inputs not getting into manufacturers' doors and then limiting them from passing on whether down the supply chain or into indeed the final uh, final customer product. What we've also had except the effects are not really being passed through to industry just yet, as we've seen the energy wholesale price uh, come down quite significantly. And um, 
Uh, it's been a real challenge over the past four quarters that energy is now making up a much large proportion of a manufacturer's total input. However, despite the energy wholesale price coming down quite significantly, it's not yet really filtering through into the bill uh, for your average industrial. Uh, that is because of elevated supplier prices and also the inception of greater uh, costs uh, of things such as network charges, standing charges, which are levied uh, uh, by by these energy suppliers. As, as a brief anecdote there, I've seen uh, from some manufacturers that I talked to recently, uh, some of their energy bills, and it was interesting to see that typically the non-variable costs, so i.e. unrelated to their usage of energy, uh, made up about 2 to 4% of their total bill uh, about, about um, anywhere between 10 and 12 months ago. The latest bill, the non-variable cost makes up about 34% of their total cost, really showing just how much, uh, how how, uh, how irrelevant, I suppose, the drop in the wholesale market price is to actually their month to month uh, bill. This is a real problem for industry. And of course, we have seen uh, Jeremy Hunt in the previous budget uh, say that he's uh, asked Ofgem to look into the possibility of regulating the business energy market, because of course, at the moment is unregulated, unlike the domestic market. Uh, so it is somewhat of the Wild West uh, in terms of business energy costs at the moment. It's hopeful that, that the reduced wholesale energy price, however, will start to pass through. And indeed, what it has had is a, a benefit in confidence that um, confidence for the industry that the energy crisis at, in, its, in its then form won't continue as it was. Can I have the next slide, please? So perhaps the, the, the one metric that hasn't changed and perhaps the most interesting on here is prices. And you can see there's something quite interesting going on with this graph. The bars on the right are much higher uh, than ever seen in this five-year time series. And of course, this is just a uh, actually it's about an eight-year snapshot. Uh, this data goes back 30 years as it is in this current form. And actually, uh, where you can see that red bar just around the 22Q1 mark, where that peaks, is actually the highest ever recorded uh, balance change figure for, U for UK prices and export prices in the following quarter ever recorded in manufacturing outlook history. And we can see for argument's sake that it's really remained at that level, uh, coming off a little bit, but, but within a few percentage balance points there. Uh, what we see in the green box as well is a moderate cooling, but still a significant amount of anticipated price growth next quarter as well, especially when we compare it to the scale of, of the, the rates of change of prices over the past eight years as, as visualized on this graph. Um, as I alluded to at the start, we can see the lines underneath here. That's UK margins and export margins. And I want you to really solely focus your attention on the right-hand side of this graph, if you will. And you'll see that around the end of 2021, around the 21 Q4 area, we can see margins start declining significantly, but prices continue rising. So we have this bizarre uh, dichotomy where quarter to quarter, manufacturers are indicating that they're raising their prices at record-breaking levels consistently for consecutive quarters. Yet despite this, margins, both UK margins and export margins, continue to be in decline, which is quite concerning, uh, showing that despite these record-breaking record -breaking price activity occurring, it was still insufficient to recoup or maintain margins. What we're seeing now, uh, and also not to, not to um, write home too quickly, but margins still remain negativity this quarter. If you can see 23Q1, if you sort of draw an imaginary line up from there, you see that um, we are still in negative margins. But the, the important and hopeful point is that we see the expectation from industry is that by next quarter, margins will return to growth, which will spell the end of about a six or seven quarter period where margins have been in continuous decline, which really gave us cause for concern at the end of last year, uh, given the expectation was that this, this uh, relationship wasn't going to change, we weren't going to see margins continue, given the outlook on the, the wider economic conditions for the sector. So that is quite encouraging. However, it should be noted that while encouraging for margins, this does indicate there will be continued uh, inflationary activity within the sector, which of course, for further concern for the Bank of England and and the government, which is, we see this as inevitable that this will continue to apply upward pressure on CPI as the essentially the supply side inflation eventually filters through into the consumer economy. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned at the start, confidence we see on the far right, a, a moderate um, uh, uptick in confidence. I suppose of interest here is that the inflection point 
uh, is the five bar. So it's diffusion index indicating that a score below five indicates negativity and a score above five indicates positivity. We have business performance in the dark red on the top and UK economic conditions uh, on the bottom. That, that's the industry's confidence in both of those things. And we see here that actually UK economic conditions confidence had just pipped down into negativity last quarter. It recovers from that position, uh, moves into positivity. It's quite normal uh, to, to anticipate a question one might have is that why, why does one so consistently lead the other? Um, uh, confidence metrics are quite, um, are quite um, superficial in a way. Um, you know, they can sway with the, the, the mood, the media mood, they can sway with the national mood. Uh, but it's quite typical that we see uh, one is typically more confident in their own business than in the wider um, UK economy. And that's why we see pretty much going back 30 years that this line, uh, the business performance line, uh, leads uh, UK economic conditions, which is which is an interesting one in and of itself. Go to the next slide, please. So the final metric I'm going to discuss today is employment and investment. And so I'll we'll start off with employment, which is the bars here. And we see in that green box bar on the far right, uh, this is quite high relative to what we've seen in previous quarters, which you can't see on the screen right now. Uh, that is the future intention to employ in the next three months. That had been very diminutive in the past couple of quarters as industry had had, uh, had sort of battened down the hiring activity for the expectation that the uh, output and orders and uh, industrial activity was going to be subdued in the coming quarters and indeed perhaps the entirety of 2023. Um, what we have seen, though, is the total vacancies rate has declined in the latest data. Uh, that's at 76,000 live vacancies in manufacturing, which by historic standards is very high. And now as a ratio, that is 3.2 um, jobs vacant in the sector per 100 employed. That is down, though, from around 95,000 live vacancies, which was the peak uh, that we saw in May 2022, uh, where the ratio was more around 4.5, so 4.5 jobs uh, vacant per every 100 employed. Still remains a significant limitation uh, in inputs for manufacturers, access to labor, uh, both, uh, both two issues, a skill shortage and a labor shortage. Um, what we also see is uh, investment, and perhaps this is a real sign of the confidence boost that we've been afforded this quarter as a sector. Uh, we see the, the orange line there that gets a little hard to see on the right, but you can see just last quarter, um, it dipped into negativity. Um, if we were betting people, we would have uh, been pretty sure at the end of last quarter that unfortunately, uh, the investment intentions metric would continue to decline along with the expectations of other metrics, not perhaps particularly steeply and certainly not as steeply as we saw in uh, in COVID times there. If you look around 2020 Q2, you can see how the investment intentions uh, uh, graph took a nosedive. But we were fairly confident uh, that there was going to trail uh, what we expected with other metrics, which is a low and slow negativity uh, for at least two to three quarters. So quite encouraging that we see investment intentions ping back up. And of course, this, this investment intentions metrics ping back up despite the ending of the more generous super deduction scheme. And while we do know that um, government uh, pro, pro business investment government policy isn't the be all and end all, uh, and actually has probably uh, from our own research around a sort of 20%, 15% impact on businesses' decisions to uh, invest. Uh, it's good to see nonetheless that despite the ending of this more generous scheme, the investment intentions can move itself out of negativity, uh, even despite the challenging business environment. So this is this is quite encouraging for the sector here. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a visualization of the of the of the forecast I mentioned at the start, just to repeat them. So we have minus 3.3% for manufacturing uh, in this year and a growth of 0.9% next year. Next slide, please. So this is exactly the same as the as the first slide, and I know I've talked a lot, but what I'll, I'll just compress three three things to take away. Um, I think those are is that the what has happened in the in between Q4, I, the end of last year, and this research window, so sort of mid March this year, has been a real unshackling of those supply side limitations that has allowed manufacturers to outperform even their own expectations that were set only last quarter. Um, the the balanced view is that. This unshackling has happened once. It's unlikely to happen again. Um, it was a, a, a bit of pent up demand with the limitations in uh, input deliveries and supplier lead times coming through. We're unlikely um, to see a sort of double uh, jump again next quarter. But as we've seen from the data, the expectation is for it to continue at about this moderately positive level, which still subverts last year's expectations. The second point to take away is that prices, price pressure and price growth continues 
um, to be present in the industry. We've seen as well in that previous slide I showed you on prices, that expectations for the next quarter's uh, price levels continues to be quite high. Uh, but margins finally, after six quarters of causing real concern of looking uh, of creating quite a, a worrying uh, trend where they separate, uh, look to be coming uh, back into growth and looking to grow back into positivity, which would be a significant uh, sigh of relief for many businesses across the country, especially if they're feeling it in their books. Finally, uh, final point is that despite all of this very strange uh, activity within the labor market, which is we have this yo-yoing of demand and cooling off, but it, for absolute terms, there still remains a significant shortage of labor within the industry with vacancies at a relative high compared to the past 30 years. Um, and a bonus point of the fourth, which is that we've very surprisingly see investment intentions jump back up, which it was not expected. So I'll leave it there and hand you back to Richard. Thanks, James. I mean, it's a, a very different picture than the one we saw, as I was saying, at the uh, the end of the last quarter. Um, there's some promising green shoots. Um, my kind of take from this is we've got one quarter of promising information. We probably need another quarter to start calling it a trend. At this point, you know, you can debate whether it's an inflection point or is it a blip. Um, but I think one thing, the other thing that comes out of that is that margins are still uh, under pressure and pricing is under pressure. So there's still things that manufacturers need to think about um, over the coming months to ensure that they remain competitive, remain com um, profitable as well. Um, the other thing I think is that, um, that the predictability, I think one of those charts showed that predictability of what the uh, what manufacturers expect to see and what actually materialises are is is becoming somewhat divergent based on the information we received. So um, predictability, I think, is a key thing to think about. Um, just in terms of sort of challenges that still exist in the sector, you know, there are changes to business rates, um, and we'll come on to come on to some other things as well in terms of repayment of government loans that will come due, um, things like plastic packaging tax. James also talked about uh, energy prices and the uh, slightly, one could almost slightly disingenuous switch of uh, costs in terms of invoices to standing charges. Um, and then um, it is really promising that there are, you know, the longer term investment intentions is improving quite significantly because we were seeing an ongoing month, quarter on quarter uh, negativity around that. That does really require ongoing government support as well. We've seen some of it, but hopefully we'll see we'll see more of it to support the um, support the industry going forwards. Um, as always, I think it's probably fair to say that it's important that uh, manufacturers maintain their eyes on profitability and cash management. Um, and with that, I think what we'll do is we'll switch over to uh, the next section, which is really talking about. Um, turnaround in manufacturing. We've got, as I said at the beginning, three uh, speakers joining joining me. Uh, we've got Chris Marsden, who's going to pick up on just some broader trends that we're seeing around insolvency and manufacturing and distress more generally. Uh, then we'll hand over to uh, Ross, who uh, will be talking about more broadly around cash and working capital management and some interesting analysis that we've been doing around that uh, over the last uh, quarter. Uh, and finally, we've got Steve Cooney joining us as well to talk about operational performance improvement. And that's really some practical insights into what businesses can do to maintain their profitability and performance uh, over the coming months. So with that, I will hand over to Chris. Chris. Thank you, Richard, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Richard said, I'm Chris Mars, and I'm a partner with BDO and I focus on working with uh, distressed businesses and helping them find solutions to their problems. Um, as Richard outlined, there are some confusing indicators, I think, in our mind in the manufacturing survey. Um, and we consider that this is really a bit of a reflection of uh, some underlying uncertainty, which still remains within the sector. And given this uncertainty, our view is that stress and distress may actually increase for some businesses at least, in the sector as we move throughout the remainder of the year. Um, for those businesses that do start to face increased trading pressures, um, I think it's pretty obvious that the time should be used now to plan and implement solutions to those and, uh, and where appropriate, implement a turnaround strategy. 
and um, Ross and Steve in a minute will cover off some of the practical ac practical actions manufacturers can take from a, a working capital and operational perspective where a turnaround is required. Uh, but before that, I just want to provide a little bit of context as to why we think stress may actually be an increasing feature for some businesses as we move forward. Uh, so uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. The, uh, the first thing to look at are the historic insolvency rates in the sector, as these can be used as a, a raw, really a raw indicator for levels of distress that we're seeing. Um, the slide shows uh, the number of administrations and creditor voluntary liquidations in the manufacturing sector since 2007. And uh, <clears throat> as you can see, 2020 and 21 had the lowest levels of insolvencies um, on, on record, um, which really is uh, quite remarkable given that those are the pandemic years. And, and that's obviously just testament to the support that uh, the government provided to businesses in that period. Uh, but as, as you can see on the right hand side of the graph, this, these insolvency numbers really rebounded last year. Um, and last year saw a 65% increase in, uh, in insolvencies. Um, and that's the highest level since 2013. And when we look at that, we think there's a, a number of factors which have, have really driven that increase. Um, firstly, and not surprisingly, the support measures provided by the government um, were, were withdrawn. Um, and uh, and also there was a commencement for many in terms of the repayment of their debts and the C-bills loans. So uh, <clears throat> some of the weaker businesses which were damaged by the pandemic were therefore left uh, somewhat more exposed than in 2020 and 21 and, and have subsequently failed. Uh, the next factor to highlight is, um, is that during the pandemic, clearly insolvencies were, uh, were suppressed and, and artificially so. So what we're experiencing really is a, a, a degree of catch up in those insolvencies. So those businesses that were allowed to limp on have effectively failed, uh, failed in the last year. Um, and then finally, th there are businesses which have become newly distressed in, in the last year. Um, this may be as a result of uh, a direct result of the pandemic um, and issues such as uh, price inflation and uh, supply chain disruption that uh, We've, we've spoken about on uh, on past calls. So going forward, it really is quite difficult, as always, to predict what insolvency numbers will be going forward. Um, but I think stating the obvious, it's unlikely that we're going to return to those record lows of 2020 and 21, um, given the uh, the current uncertainty and the issues some in the sector are facing. If we could move to the next slide, please. Um, on this slide, we want to provide a bit of a snapshot um, of the manufacturing subsectors, subsectors which were most distressed during the last year. <clears throat> and uh, looking at the insolvency, the insolvency data, no, no subsector has been immune. Um, and I think it's fair to say, though, that some have uh, suffered from a higher degree of stress than others. Um, the chart on the screen shows the subsectors which represent 5% or more of all manufacturing insolvencies in 2022. Um, and in summary, the, uh, the, the most uh, badly hit sectors are food products, machinery and equipment, furniture, repairs and installation, printing, and the, the standout one really is, uh, is metal fabricators. The, the interesting thing about, uh, about these particular subsectors is that if you look across the, the last 10 years or so, they have uh, consistently been the subsectors which have had most insolvencies in them. And, um, and clearly there's no guarantee that looking at the historic pass pattern will be replicated going forward. Uh, but uh, I suspect this long-term uh, trend has a, a strong chance of continuing as we move through the re remainder of uh, 2023. So moving on to the next slide, please. Um, we thought it would be useful uh, to provide you with a bit of a snapshot as to what we're seeing in the situations where we're, we're being asked to help businesses in, in stressed or distressed situations. And really what, what we are seeing very much echoes um, those insolvency numbers. And by that, I mean that over the course of the last year, we have definitely seen an increase in the calls from, uh, from stressed manufacturers. 
and uh, and that's certainly been a trend which has continued in the first months of the year. Um, the issues we're seeing will come as no surprise to many of you, um, and they're listed on the, the left-hand side of the slide. Uh, as you'll appreciate, that there are many causes of distress in a business, and it isn't usually one which is solely responsible for a business's problems, but rather a, a combination of these. But uh, having said that, if I was if I was asked to pick uh, one of the main issues faced by the businesses that we're currently working with, it's that there's been um, sustained losses and margin deterioration over a number of years. Uh, these businesses tend to typically be uh, low margin in nature, um, and they've managed to limp on through taking on additional debt and using all of the available assets to provide security. And whilst this strategy in some cases can support a turnaround for a certain length of time, in the situations we're witnessing at the moment, uh, that time frame is just not long enough to, uh, to reposition the business. And another reoccurring cause is, uh, is a loss of a key customer. And uh, we've seen a number of examples of this recently, uh, some in the automotive sector, which is probably not a surprise, where a key customer has been lost. And that's often as a result of a decision to uh, to support, uh, sorry, to source products from uh, from outside of the UK. Um, so clearly any of those factors that we, we've got on the slide can lead to pressure on working capital um, and result in credit to stretch, breach covenants, and possibly the transfer to uh, to a bank's high risk team where uh, where bank debt's involved, and and clearly that that sort of mixture of um, of a situation is a position that no one really wants to end up in. So the key is to spot issues early and take steps to plan and implement a turnaround strategy whilst these can still be funded. And uh, and that's it from me. Thank you. So uh, with that, I'll pass over to Ross who can talk a little bit more about uh, the working capital aspect, aspects of turnaround. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. And thanks, Chris. Uh, great to be talking with you all today. Um, so I'm Ross McClure. I'm one of the team here at BDO, specialising in supporting our manufacturing clients with working capital improvement and optimization. So the focus is really on supporting businesses with practical actions and to release cash from the balance sheet. So what I'm going to be talking through today is a couple of trends we're seeing in the sector. Um, the impact they're having on manufacturers' work and capital cycles, and then some practical steps through which businesses can look to build resilience into their processes and, and, and essentially optimise performance. Next slide, please. Um, so what are we seeing across the industry from a working capital and cash lockup perspective? A good um, barometer of how confident businesses are generally feeling with respect to their cash position and liquidity is the time that it takes them to pay their suppliers. And so the logic here is that, generally speaking, if businesses are concerned about their cash levels, a very common short-term mitigation is to push out their payable balance. The graph I'm showing on screen here uses data taken from Bayes Records that looks at the average number of days large companies have taken to pay their suppliers. So the number tends to be fairly consistent in terms of days between 35 and 40. But what we are seeing here for the last two quarters um, is that manufacturing businesses have been slowing their payments fairly considerably. Um, so this isn't really a trend that we've seen across the whole economy. Um, and the recent spike is fairly unique to, to manufacturing businesses. Um, and although this is only a couple of data points, um, what we could be seeing here is kind of that early warning signal um, that recent challenges are maybe causing manufacturers to manage their cash a lot more carefully and actively to, to preserve liquidity. Next slide, please. So what might be causing this response? So one of the biggest challenges we're hearing from the sector currently is the continued impact of uh, supply chain disruption and uncertainty. So over the last two or three years, there's been a number of local and global issues that have reduced manufacturers' confidence in their supply chains, which has very adversely impacted their operations and caused them to possibly rethink the way in which they operate. Um, so what this has done is, is almost create a shift um, in the way manufacturers are approaching their supply chain. So for years, the generally accepted best practice approach to inventory uh, and supply chain management has been just in time. 
what we're starting to see here is a shift more to that just in case model um, where businesses are weighing up the cost of um, you know cost benefits they get from a fully optimized inventory management process with the risk that they're facing in terms of supply chain uncertainty. So one of the mitigations that's been put in place um, is increasing, especially for critical components, the level of inventory held. So is this being shown in the data? Uh, and in short, absolutely it is. So what's being shown on screen here is uh, the day's inventory outstanding metric for the manufacturing industry in the last four financial years. Although the data is slightly outdated um, because it's taken from publicly available accounts, what we can see clearly um, is that manufacturing businesses are holding more inventory um, and that this is locking up cash on the balance sheet. And then the graph on the right gives an indication uh, at the, of, of the pace, essentially, at which this is being done by subsector. And we can see that across the majority of sub subsectors, um, inventory growth is outstripping revenue growth which gives a good indication that businesses are building inventories reserves likely in an effort to um, build resilience. Next slide, please. So what are the steps manufacturers can take to reduce pressure um, and optimise even in the face of uncertainty and try and release cash from their balance sheets? So what's being shown on screen here is the end-to-end the -end cash conversion cycle, and it consists of the three core work capital cycles um, and the way in which businesses essentially convert sales demand into cash. Now, a lot of businesses uh, kind of have a tendency to focus on each of the cycles individually and view them as three separate uh, sub-business processes, essentially. Um, and a much better and effective way of viewing them is more as one end-to-end -end process whereby they're all viewed in unison and all calibrated with each other. So the reason for that being that there's, as shown on screen, multiple interdependencies and such points between the three cycles, and optimization is often much more easily achieved when the sub-processes are aligned. A good starting point on this end-to-end -end cycle is to really isolate the key area of risk across your cash conversion cycle and focus on mitigations to these specific risks rather than just building a kind of blanket or excessive risk mitigation um, set of steps uh, into each step of this process. Next slide, please. Um, but practically, what kind of actions are we discussing with our clients currently? So shown on screen here is a, a number of short, medium uh, and longer term actions that can be taken to, to optimise working capital across the cycles. It's by no means a, a kind of exhaustive list and I, I won't go into all of them but to focus on a few of the critical ones. So the top one across all timeframes is communication. Fundamentally important to building strong work and capital processes, sustainable and resilient relationships is communicating effectively with suppliers, customers, and funders. Ensuring that from each of these stakeholders group, stakeholder groups, as much information as possible is gathered, that's really gonna help with making informed decisions, managing uncertainty, and building in a, a level of open risk sharing. That then feeds into a robust forecast, uh, forecasting and scenario planning tool. Um, so according to your risk profile and tolerance, running scenario analysis on cash flow and inventory levels will really help to, to manage the uncertainty that you face uh, and ultimately build resilience. Um, and despite businesses generally holding more industry, uh, inventory, it's important not to do this across all component categories and inventory items. So what our suggestion would be is that undertaking detailed analysis of where the risk lies across input materials and ensuring that safety stock is held only for those components where risk can't be mitigated will help manage risk, um, but not too excessively and not have too much impact on the amount of cash that's held on the balance sheet. And then finally, uh, in the longer term bucket there on the right hand side, there's a lot of reference to metrics, targets and incentivization. What this is really referring to is that hearts and minds piece. Um, so with volatility and uncertainty currently so high, um, making sure that employees and colleagues are making the right decisions um, and are incentivized to do so um, is incredibly important uh, to getting the whole process optimized. I'll just hand over there to Steve. 
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is um, Stephen Cooney. I am an expert in trans operational transformation and have got a significant amount of experience of supporting businesses to find, plan and implement uh, transformation programs to improve EBITDA. Over my um, 25 year manufacturing career, I've supported both small and medium enterprises and also much larger organizations as well. And um, when I've not been an advisor, I've worked for Ford Motor Company and also for uh, Federal Mogul. And uh, as a past manufacturing engineer, I hope I speak your, uh, your languages as well. So on to the next slide, please. The, this, this slide shows the various states of um, corporate health um, organizations can be in all the way from growth on the left-hand side to closure on the right-hand side and shows a number of options for turnaround in, in the business. Now, it's fair to say over the last um, three years, what with COVID, the war in Ukraine, Brexit, and the semiconductor chip shortage, a number of businesses have moved to transition to the right-hand side of this slide. And certainly our analysis shows that certain manufacturing sectors are more resilient than others. So for instance, in our analysis and work has shown that if you're something like a tobacco industry where you've already got historically high levels of profit, you're going to be very resilient to these issues. We're a sector much closer to my heart, the automotive sector, which has had historically low profit margins even before these um, traits materialized. A lot more companies in this sector are now showing signs of distress. And indeed, a lot more companies, according to last financial results, are now showing into negative loss making situations. So this diagram shows from an operational point of view, those highlighted slides, um, two, real, two real focuses really. One is a more strategic level, which is looking at restructuring of existing facilities and operating model. And another one, the second one, is much more of a tactical type improvements at the factory improvement level. If we could just move on to the next slide, please. So at a, at, a, at a kind of macro level improvements, this really is targeting towards um, fairly large businesses that have got a multi-site, potentially international footprint. And there are much bigger opportunities here to, to actually remove costs and become more efficient. And so the, the things that folks can work on will be looking at challenging the target operating model, challenging the number of facilities that our companies have got, and indeed where products are actually made. But one of the barriers that we found in our experience of sporting companies is you, you find a lot of parochial behavior is actually a big barrier to change. So, for example, the, the management structure of an organization that is geographically based um, versus a organization which is, if you like, sales based and operations based, the latter is much more likely to be able to implement improvements because you'll have one individual who's in charge across operations across the entire footprint rather than having a managing director of, of a certain geography. And so some of the, some of the type of things that uh, people will be looking at will be looking at the um, you know, sales and operations planning can be done on a collective basis. You can look at whether you make or buy products and also look at where you're actually holding um, individual locations. And certainly we work with our tax colleagues to look at legal structures. And indeed, if, if you've actually simplified your operations so much, you can actually challenge whether you need legal entities in those organisations and look at corporate simplification actions to, to uh, save money. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Looking at um, micro level improvements, so this tends to fall focus on kind of like single company sites. And there are typically two types of costs in a business. Uh, one obviously is headcount um, costs and the other is third party costs. And so th this is where you're going to be looking at things like, you know, do we have enough work for the people to actually do? What kind of productivity and process improvements can we do to actually take out those direct heads and um, automate production? Do we actually need to actually make everything we do in the factory or could we actually offshore or, or transfer it to a, um, a third party organization? And once you've actually focused on looking at things that impact the direct headcount and direct resources, there's a significant opportunity then to look at the actual indirect management structure managing those people. Because if you've got less direct heads, you need less management structure to support them. And also on third party costs, you've got two types really of costs, those which are actually contracted. Uh, and those which are largely of discretionary spend. We've seen a lot of businesses and certainly some of our smaller clients that have struggled to pass on costs in the last year. And we, we know one of the clients we work at the moment has actually experienced a two or three million pounds EBITDA loss this year, 
because simply because they were not quick enough to identify the actual input costs were going up and didn't react quick enough to pass those costs on to um, onto suppliers. But the the, the key the key uh, fact to take away from here is really it's by having that vision and experience at an operational level to actually understand and know what levers that you need to pull. Now, if you just move on to the uh, final slide in my section, please. This slide shows a typical output of some kind of diagnostic type of work that you would that you should be doing. And it really shows that after a two or three week period of uh, working at a multi, across a multi-site um, organization, the type of opportunities that you can unearth and, and actually to prioritize them. Now, many of the businesses that we work for come back to us and challenge us and say, you haven't really told us anything that we didn't know. And I guess my, my response to that is, absolutely, but why haven't you implemented all these things that you, you know, and why aren't they not put into a business plan to deliver it? So our experience is that companies are, whilst they may have the actual knowledge to diagnose the opportunity, they're, they're poor at actually planning the delivery of them. And in our experience, plan, uh, programs fail because there's insufficient resources allocated to the program. And then they don't have the actual right implementation structure sitting around that program to actually implement those changes. So I guess my challenge um, to um, operation directors listening on the call, do you have a plan that shows over the next 18 months how you're going to take cost out of your organization? How are you going to improve the efficiency, drive productivity? If you're a financial director listening on the call, do you have that um, you know, level of financial support? Do you actually have in your forecast and your business plan showing how operations is going to transform gross margin and efficiency going forward? And if you're a managing director listening to the call, do you, have you got your operations director and your finance director working together to drive those improvements? And do you have the right level of incentivization in your organization to drive those right behaviors? So thank you very much for uh, listening. I'm going, I'm going to hand back over to Richard, who's going to uh, finish up. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Ross. Uh, and thanks, Chris. I mean, um, <clears throat> things to think about there. Um, a lot of it is, um, it's real sensible, profitable business management that we're talking about there. And the three things that really jump out to me, the three words that jump out to me from those, uh, those uh, presentations was, one is around planning, making sure, again, that you really have a plan and you stick to it. The second one, which I think Ross picked up on particularly, was communicating really well, and that's both uh, with lenders, uh, but also within the business as well, so that there are no surprises. And the other bit is that clearly you can manage what you can manage within your business, uh, but external factors may, may come to play in terms of what happens. So in, in terms of understanding how your operating model works and the implications of any changes to macro situations is really understanding what sort of scenarios might be worth planning so that you, are, you have a number of alternate routes that you can take to maintain performance and, and profitability. Um, with that, I think um, uh, what we'll do is we'll probably open up the, uh, up the floor to some questions uh, to the participants. So, um, Bao, if I could hand over to you, that would be great. Brilliant. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we've had a few questions come through. So, James, um, going back to some of the points you made around prices um, accelerating at the moment, but margins still remaining in contraction. One of the questions is, um, are manufacturers pushing through input costs efficiently? So what was the final couple of words in that question? Are they costing efficiently? Are, are they pushing through input costs <clears throat> efficiently? Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so I think exactly what we've seen over the past year is that there's been a limit, and we've heard this anecdotally as well, there's a limit to, and, and in theory, that limit is 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 nearly reached as to, to what degree manufacturers are able to pass those costs on. We've seen a lot of change over the past year, particularly when it comes to contract pricing. The growth in dynamic pricing or, or whatever word you might ascribe to it, i.e. where you charge, um, you charge your customer uh, more variable costs, whether the variable costs on materials, variable costs on energy, which has been a really hard one, and on labor and so on. Um, it's the competitive nature of being able to do that, but also uh, at what point your customer rejects 
um, that price rise. Um, quite quite funny, we saw at the start of this, we saw you, you know double digit price rises on the phone between customers and suppliers, and they were just roundly accepted without without a moment's discussion. Um, I think that's likely come come to an end, uh, but it's certainly what what that graph and that relationship between prices raising at their fastest ever eight quarters quarter, but margins not coming to not not improving at the same time is is what we're seeing is that limit. The manufacturers being unable on aggregate to pass on a rate of cost that is commensurate enough to um, enough to see the margins also um, benefit. Uh, I'll, I'll come in on that as well because um, pricing has has been quite a significant area of conversation that we've been having with clients across the board. Clearly, in a B two B situation, uh, the ability to pass through price rises quickly can be constrained by existing contracts that you know historically may have run out for three or five years. So it, there, you, you typically do expect to see some sort of lag between. Uh, cost increases and the ability to to pass through um, price rises to end customers. Having said that, um, James, I totally agree with you in terms of the case that you need to put to your end customer to justify those price rises needs to be put together in a very, um, you know, I guess, considered way, uh, uh, so that it's clear. And, and there's a clear understanding from the uh, customer group of why you're doing this and the impact and implications of not being able to pass that price increase through as well. So, um, yeah, James, totally agree with you. Um, the challenge is always, you know, how quickly can we do it and how sophisticated can we be in terms of developing our pricing strategy? Brilliant, thank you. Um, so the next question, um, given the recent data on manufacturing labour shortages, and James, you spoke about um, the number of vacancies in the sector as well, what can manufacturers do to limit their risk of high staff turnover? Does anyone have any thoughts around that? Should I, should I answer that one? Or Jake, do you want to go first, James? I'll offer the start of a 10 and it's it sort of it, it's uh, circle, it sort of goes around the question. I'll let you answer it head on. It's something that we've noticed. And I didn't mention in my presentation is a real proclivity to let staff go. Uh, there's been a, a bit of a learning in the industry, particularly over the past three or four years post COVID and during COVID that the staff that unfortunately manufacturers were forced to let go during COVID, they found it very hard to recoup. Um, as often they've left the workforce or changed industry uh, when hiring was back on the cards over the past two years. Um, this is something that we expect to, to not see again. So we expect companies will be very, uh, will be reluctant to let staff go uh, in the coming quarters, even, even given uh, last quarter we were predicting a, a bit of a downturn. We still thought there'll be very little um, release of staff from businesses for this reason of the, the the real laser focus on retaining skills and retaining labor within the business within the business, given how hard and how hard it continues to be to to um, a, a recruit staff. Stephen, on to you. Hey, thanks, Joe. So I was just going to uh, reference some excellent Make UK data that was released um, a couple months ago that showed that the average age in manufacturing is 52 and that's something like 20 to 25 percent of the workforce on that basis is likely to retire over the next um, five to eight years which in addition to the current number of vacancies presents a worrying change so I think holding on to your existing staff is really important and and secondly um, to actually look at productivity uh, and ways of actually increasing productivity with the existing number of staff Certainly some of the organisations we've worked with have got very, very high staff turnovers higher than the average. So it's actually very important to make sure you've got the right incentivization levels for people on the shop floor, the right pay grades and some kind of vision where somebody coming in that might be earning minimum wage, how they can progress very quickly to earning a level of wage that is actually significantly higher than just going to pour coffee and cost the coffee such that they like to stay. And if they don't have that vision, it's much likely to, to actually retire and leave the business. Brilliant, thank you, Stephen. Thanks, James. Um, so the next question, um, how have manufacturing businesses reacted to significant inflationary pressures in the last year? Um, and that includes energy prices and wage rises. And what is the outlook for the next 18 months? I can have a crack at that one. So um, I think we've we've 
I, I suppose not to, to retread old ground. I think one of the major things we've seen is, is we see that in the prices metric. So we see that in that those elevated levels of pricing. So of course, with the inflationary environment, what our data and what, what the site is showing is, is what manufacturers are doing with their pricing. So I won't retread that. And we can see that's, that's very high. Uh, with regards to energy, what we have seen, this is particularly interesting, is a real acceleration, uh, perhaps by by um, as, as a side effect, really, of the crisis, an acceleration towards um, those 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 net zero technologies, towards those net zero goals. Um, this is really as a as a bill uh, to as a, as a means to reduce the bill, as a means to reduce um, dependence on the grid. Uh, in in we've seen quite a lot of, and it's always surprised me when I visit sites of uh, clever ways of structuring machinery, clever ways of structuring uh, run times, uh, quite often in, say, the popular ones in a four-day week um, for, for, for labor efficiency measures, but as, of course, as well, energy efficiency measures, having a look at plants, seeing exactly where the low-hanging fruit is uh, to retain heat, that is of, often in insulation, around lighting, um, and those sorts of things. And all of these have been chiefly in pursuit of reducing the energy bill. But of course, in the same hand, uh, they make uh, they make substantial process uh, by 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 virtue of that towards uh, making various businesses or making the plant uh, taking a step towards um, net zero and overall improving its energy efficiency. Uh, one thing to note, of course, is that actually what I've seen in a couple of anecdotes, this is around the the, the Sheffield area. This was um, I was talking to a group of companies and. Uh, the rate at which those companies in that, that area had been looking, uh, for example, this instance was to put solar panels on their on their roofs to, to start some in-house generation. Um, the demand was so great that no one could get a supplier, that the supplier base for these technologies was being overstretched um, by the nature of the companies turning around at such a rate um, and wanting to build that in-house capacity. So that's, that's an interesting um, sort of secondary effect that's happened that the supply of these consultants and these technologies that are able to do this for plants are now in very short supply. I suspect this will be a temporary measure though. Brilliant, thank you, James. Um, and just conscious of time, we have one last question. So we'll quickly whiz through this. What is the one thing that companies should be focusing on over the next three to six months? Who wants to start with that one first? Do I kick that off and we'll, 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 should we go around everyone and see what, see what see if we've got converging opinions or we've got starkly different ones? This would be fascinating, actually. Um, I, I think it's it's really keeping an eye on your financials and running scenarios. Um, as I was saying before, the predictability within manufacturing right now hopefully is improving. But if we if we look at the last two quarters of data, what people are expecting and what actually happened were two very different things. So, um, and, you know, the other thing is that this quarter looks promising, um, but you need more than one data point to draw a trend line. Um, so hopefully it's the start of something uh, of, a, of a kind of inflection point to improve, but we need to, we need to make sure that um, as a sector, we maintain discipline and maintain the ability to flex. The, the, uh, the sector's historically been extremely good and extremely resilient we need to maintain that um so I, I would say stick to the knitting but one of the key things is make sure that you are able to um uh scenario plan and understand the implications as changes do occur um over the next uh, six months or so who's going to go next i'll go richard uh, i'll just build on that i think it's really important to have a robust forecasting process um and we uh, we get involved in situations where where sadly that's not the case, and um, and businesses haven't really identified the problems as early as they they may do, and uh, and building on that, I think if uh, if you have got a robust forecasting process and you're starting to see that actually uh, problems on the horizon, then early engagement with your stakeholders as uh, as soon as you can do can't uh, uh, can't be a bad thing to do. I'm not going to disagree. The only thing I'd add is that if you're doing your scenario planning, you're, it's often treated as a mathematical finance exercise where the FD takes minus five or minus 10% off the numbers or adds plus five or plus 10. I think really you should be looking at higher numbers than that to properly do it. And also it should involve operations to actually understand, you know, if your turnover falls by 30%, what are the implications and how do we quickly resolve that? 
But equally, if your turnover goes up by 30%, do we have the manufacturing capacity to actually build the product and the necessary working capital to fund that extra raw materials and inventory? I'll offer up an extremely specific point, um, but it might benefit some, which is that if you uh, have competition in the EU or you trade with the EU or companies within the EU a lot, uh, and you are particularly energy intensive process, I would keep a, a, a good trained eye on what those partners competitors in Europe are doing, given uh, the disparity in energy support that many major manufacturing nations in Europe are in receipt of, and what that's going to mean for the opportunities for your competition or your partners uh, to take on a more beneficial pricing to them that might harm uh, your market. So that is something going forwards that I think if, if you're exposed to EU markets and with competition in the EU and you're energy intensive, there is something in the next few years where major manufacturing nations in Europe will be in receipt of greater energy support. And I'll agree with all of that, just add communication, as was on the slide. Ultimately, communication helps the amount of information you've got, which will ultimately help um, how robust your scenario planning is.